There we go. All right. Well, happy Sabbath, Saints. Happy Sabbath. Good to be here. Welcome everybody online. Wonderful to see you. Um, so today's sermon is the problem of evil. It's going to cover that topic. It's actually a very um, contemporary topic, but it's not a new topic. Uh, for a couple of things before we jive into the slides. Uh, back in uh, last year, during part of the um, Logic series, I did a, a little sermonette on the Epi Epicurean Paradox, uh, which deals somewhat with the problem of evil. It's one way that the problem of evil is posited. So this is by no means a rehash of that at all. Uh, this is a much expanded treatise on the issue of the problem of evil, and hopefully it's edifying. Uh, one of the things that really has, I believe, given me the unction to do this uh, is recently I've been talking with a lot of people just in the public and talking, and, and this, this kind of thing is really on people's minds. Couple that with some of the things that have been going on in our congregation with people with, you know, the death of parents and loved ones and illnesses and such and everything to wonder the problem of evil. So I think it's a very important topic to discuss. So before we, so one of the things we need to do then when we talk about this is define some terms. So we're going to stick with English. I'm not going to start breaking down Hebrew stuff, but, or Greek, which is fine, but I'm going to stick with, but just, just to find some terms. So when we talk about what is evil, who is God, things like that, where we make sure we understand we're talking about the same thing. So the first, the first uh, term that we're going to define is who is God? Now, that's a big question. And I'm not going to try to cover it in the sense of if you talk about a God from a Buddhist sense, well, there is no God in Buddhism, so there is no God. Uh, in, 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 a, uh, in a Hindu sense, it's very similar to Buddhism, except that the, the highest level is just to be absorbed into the nothingness, so that would be God, but it's not an intelligent entity. Um, the God or the gods of the Mormons, for example, have all kinds of oddities and weird things going on. So you never know what they're thinking or talking about. The God of Islam is a God that is quite fickle and just kind of decides as if he's a puppet master what, you know, this person gets this and this one doesn't. And it's essentially, it's a very Calvinistic God, essentially. So there are many. So I'm not going to try to to address all the different ideas of God out there uh, for the sake of this discussion. Most people that reject God or are doubting of God's existence as a result of evil um, frame God in the classical Christian context. And so I'm just going to go over that real quick here. So who is God? So here in, in short, and I, this first sentence I actually got from uh, Got Answers. I thought it was a good one. The supreme being, the creator and ruler of all that is, the self-existent one who is perfect in power goodness, and wisdom. Additionally, he has a son, Jesus, by whom we are able to have a relationship with him through. Um, additionally, he has some attributes. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, that means he's everywhere, and he's all-loving. So these are some of the, the, the points that would define who is God. Um, so as I said, generally people who kick against God, especially here in the West, they kick against this idea of God, an, an all-powerful, all-knowing uh, czar of the heavens, so to say, that uh, is up there, and they kick against that. So this usually, in, in most cases, is already somewhat of an assumption when people have objection towards God here in the West. It's this, this definition or this basic definition of God that they're kicking against. doesn't mean they believe in this God, but so I'm going to give a few verses out of Scripture, again, for the benefit of the Christians. So <clears throat> I'm going to cover the four attributes. So I'm just going to do a few verses for each one. So the first one, God is all-powerful or omnipotent or omnipotent, as some would say. Uh, so we have Daniel 4.35, and I'm going to just going to go through these pretty quick. So I'm not going to focus on these. So I'm just going to kind of glance through. So if the slides will be available later for download. But if you're writing verses down, write fast. So I'm just going to kind of read the, the red letters. So. so he does according to his will, and none can stay his hand. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, we see here that um, not one of them falls apart from your father's will. So he has power. If he doesn't want it to fall, 
then it's not going to fall. A couple more verses, Isaiah 14, 27, and Job 42, 1 and 2a. We see here, for the Lord hosts purpose, and who can disannul it? Who can stop what he purposed? And who shall turn it back? In Job, we read here, you can, um, you can do everything. God can do everything. There's nothing that he can't do. So on this topic, actually, so before we move on to the next attribute, is it true? Is there anything that God can't do? So if he is all-powerful, is there anything that God can't do? So, right, there are many things that God can't do. So being all-powerful does not mean that he can do everything. So there are there are things that God can't do. Yes, the answer is yes. It's a little yes there, but it's a... So he can't lie. He can't be unrighteous. He can't be overpowered. He can't be a fool. He can't contradict himself. We may, we may think we see contradictions, but he can't truly contradict himself. And additionally, and this is more the focus... Um, of this attribute that we'll use as we go through this um, discussion about the problem of evil is that he can't do things that are not logically possible, such as he can't make a square circle. That has nothing to do with power. There's no such thing. The definition of a circle is that it has no, no corners. It has no, it has no angles in it. So it's, that is the definition of a circle. So you can't make something. So that would be illogical. God can't do that. Not because he isn't all powerful. That has nothing to do with power. Um, God, he can't make a rock so heavy that he can't lift it. Again, that's just ridiculous. That's not a real thing. Um, and he can't, he can't make everyone turn to him in faith. And we'll talk about free will a little later. So these are some things here that he can't do because they are logically unsound or impossible. Not because God isn't all-powerful. So the fact that there are things that God cannot do does not mean he is not all-powerful at all. People try to throw this. This is one of the arguments people try to throw and say, well, so he's not all-powerful. Then if he can't do everything, then he's not all-powerful. That's not true. That's a completely different definition. They're trying to change what terms are. So so God is all-powerful. He's uh, omnipotent. The next attribute we're going to take a look at is he's all-knowing. And so the we have a, a finishing up verse 2 out of Job 42 here. Uh, and that no thought can be withholden from you. And in Isaiah 46, 10, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. So he knows our thoughts and not only that, that, but he knows stuff that hasn't happened yet. So it's not just a matter of he knows everything that's going on now, but he, because he can see everything. But more than that, he can see in our hearts and he knows what's going to happen in the future. One more verse set of verses on this attribute. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. He is a discerner, so it says the word here, but God is the word. The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And all things are naked, open to his eyes. So he sees everything, he knows everything that has happened, that is happening, that will happen. And not just events, but he knows the hearts and the thoughts of the people. He knows the core reason. He knows um, why atoms stay together. He knows that. He, he made that up. We don't know that. We have no clue. We have some things we call the strong, the strong force and the weak force and all that, but we don't know why. He knows why. He knows all that stuff. So he is all-knowing. And the next a attribute is that he is everywhere at once, or he's omnipresent. So this doesn't mean, so we, we don't think, so God is not a physical being in that sense that he is physically like in the molecules everywhere but he is everywhere there is no place that he is not so and, and this kind of overlaps with all knowing because if he's all knowing he would have to be able to see everything too so there is some overlap definitely but this is it's worth going into this real quick here so proverbs 15 3 um the lord you are in every place jeremiah 23 24 god says do not i fill heaven and earth says the lord Acts 17, 27, Paul talking to the, the pagans um, in Athens. Um, but he be not far from every one of us. He's everywhere. We may close off his existence and his presence or attempt to, but he's not. He's everywhere. Another set of verses out of Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12 on the same topic. This essentially is the one where it's like, well, if I go to heaven, you're there. Um, if I go down to hell, you're there. Um, even, even, even if I go to the uttermost parts of the sea, even, even there, you're there. Um, 
even I try to hide in darkness, you can see in the night that you are the light. So there's nowhere that I can physically go that your presence is not there. There is no, there is no cover that I can use to hide myself from your presence. Even the, the deepest darkness, he is there. So another attribute that actually isn't one of the classical attributes of God, but it certainly is an attribute of God. But the reason that I mention it's not one of the classical attributes of God that is used in, in arguments against his existence because of evil uh, is what, what is known as omnibenevolence or all loving. And the reason that I mention this is because the other, the other terms, all powerful, with the exception that people try to finagle that and say, well, he can't do this, so he can't be all powerful. But that's pretty straightforward. And all knowing, that's, I mean, the definition is pretty easy to come to an understanding. We're talking about the same thing. He knows everything. And all present, you know, we can, it's easy to come to an understanding. But when we say omnibenevolent, we can get a whole lot of subjective ideas in there to define what is benevolence, what is love. So that's one of the reasons why they've put this particular wrinkle into the argument. But it's not really a wrinkle as long as you clearly define terms and understand that this is absolutely true of God if you look at it from God's perspective and, and look at it in the manner that he has revealed it to us. So we see a few verses here. We see in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, uh, John is talking about God, and he says here, God is love. And in Romans 2, 4, uh, Paul talks about that all these things that no matter what you might be going through, if you know the goodness of God, that God loves you, he leads you to repentance, to goodness. Another place here, John 3, 16, very well-known verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And in Romans 5, 8, Paul essentially says a very similar thing, but God commands his love toward us or commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He is all loving. He does love. So those are just some brief, um, high view scriptural examples of those attributes. When you're talking with somebody who either has some, some Christian education and is aware of the verses, or someone who just really doesn't, but they're not convinced that God exists, just reading scripture to them probably isn't going to help a whole lot. They've either heard it before, and whatever intellectual objection they have for it isn't going to be swayed by hearing the same verses they've already heard and rejected. Or they don't hold the Bible or, as an authority, so just because the Bible says it doesn't mean that I should believe it. And we're going to get into more a little later of, well, why would you even want to talk to somebody like that? So we'll get into that a little later. But nonetheless, those verses that I read there are mostly for the believers to understand that these, these attributes that are attributed to him or um, are they are biblical. They're not just something out of antiquity that some you know great thing that people put together like the seven deadly sins. Those things aren't necessarily, those are all sins in their context, but they're not biblical. So they would be a difficult thing to biblically defend the seven deadly sins as they are. Whereas the attributes of God that we covered there, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his om omnipresence, and his omnibenevolence are biblically sound attributes or characteristics of God. So, that, so just to review real quick before we move on, the definition of God that we're talking about is the one God that created everything, the one God that is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-loving, that it is that God that the context of this argument or defense or discussion is in regards to. If someone else comes up with another God that isn't the same, would be a completely different discussion, and it would be mainly focused on, no, your idea of God is wrong. Let's get you first convinced of who God really is, and then we can move forward from there. So, so the second term that I want to review or cover is what is evil. So this is a good question. So evil usually uh, is usually thought of as that which is morally wrong, sinful, or wicked. However, the word evil can also refer to anything that causes harm with or without the moral dimension. So we'll talk about moral evils and natural evils here in a minute, and then we'll talk about them in more depth later on. But so, so here this definition is, this is what evil is. Now, 
there is so what i want to point out here is that evil isn't actually a thing or a being or an entity it's not like some kind of goo that you can scrape off or that you can find in a bucket somewhere it's not it isn't a thing evil is not a thing it is a characteristic that um, morally significant beings can take on upon themselves they can be evil they can do evil things but evil itself isn't a thing and so there's a word that i think helps um, and the word is privation. It's not a word that's very commonly used, but it kind of means deprived. It's deprivation or deprived, this same root. So privation is a state of being deprived. And examples are dark is the privation of light. So there's no, so when it's dark in a room, it's not, there, darkness isn't a thing. It's the absence of light. Um, the same thing, cold is the privation of heat. So there really isn't such thing as cold. It's just less hot. And um, as some, Thomas Aquinas, um, Augustine and others would state that evil is the privation of good. So evil isn't a thing, but if you are not good, if you're not doing good, then you're doing evil. So I think that while, while I don't want to put a stake in the ground and say evil is the privation of good, I think it, it frames it fairly well that we understand that evil isn't a thing. So evil isn't something, evil is not like a, a disease that might be evil. And so we can attack disease to stop the evil. Evil is not a thing itself. Evil has, um, as Paul uh, elocutes in Timothy, uh, that the love of money is the root of all evil. So in that context there, it's the lust. So if you would, if you would attack the source of the evil, the love of money in that case there, the evil characteristic and action would disappear. So I know I'm sounding kind of technical here. I just want to cover some stuff up front. I think I'll, it'll become clearer later on why this is important. People don't normally think this way in general. And, and we don't need to think this technically every moment of the day. But it is important that we understand these technical aspects of this argument and, and who God is and what evil is. Because there are times when we might have discussions with people, and if we can't come to, we can talk right past each other and not necessarily even realize it. Or even if we realize we're talking past each other, we may not know how to get to a common starting point so we can move forward. And I think that these terms and this technical um, level of understanding can help get there sometimes. So what is evil carrying on? So there is moral evil. And so this essentially is evil committed or caused by immoral acts. Um, the, and these can only be committed by mankind or other moral beings, such as Satan or demons or whatever. Animals and other creatures cannot commit moral evil, although they might commit natural evil. Now, I know that if all of you that have pets especially, you know there are times when at least it seems like they are deliberately disobeying, that they know what they're supposed to be doing, and they are deliberately, they are deliberately doing the opposite or not doing what they're supposed to be doing. That is it. Yeah. Cat owners, dog owners, chicken owners, everything, you know, yes. <laughs> so, and, and we, we, from our, from our point of view, we would look at that as well. That's just like my little kid, you know, this is stubborn, spoiled little kid. It's not the same. Animals are not moral creatures. They do not have God's standards that they are judged by. We, and when, and in reality, um, domesticated animals as pets, that's not, God didn't make them to be pets. I mean, I got a cat, so I have a pet. I enjoy her company, but God didn't make the animals to be pet. Man has taken and, and essentially selectively bred animals down into a breed that would have not have naturally existed. And so we can only expect that that man-made version of these animals would act in aberrations manners, that they would do things sometimes that <laughs> just doesn't make sense. So it's not a moral thing. Animals are not moral. They don't make moral decisions. So if there is some evil that comes about as a result of an animal, it is a natural evil, not a moral evil. Make sense? Good. A little bit more on moral evil. We'll get to natural evil in a minute. A little bit on moral evil. Um, so to have moral evil, there has to be um, a standard. Disobedience to a standard is the moral evil. And to have a standard, it requires that there is someone that can set the standard. So at my, my employment, my boss sets certain standards, when I'm supposed to work, what work I'm supposed to do, other, you know, we have a code of conduct that we're supposed to follow. Those are standards that my employer 
has created, and I have willingly put myself under the authority of my employer. We have a contract. I do what they tell me to do, and they give me some money. You know, so I mean, that's pretty much. Not that I don't enjoy what I do, but nonetheless. So that is a standard. They have set a standard. And so if I am, if I disobey that standard, I commit a moral transgression against that standard. It is a moral standard. Now, now their standard may be in contrast or um, opposite to what God's standard is. That might be the case, in which case I should follow God's standard, certainly. But that's what, so it requires someone that can set the standard. And biblically, or Christians believe that God sets the moral standard and that disobedience to, to it is known as sin, transgression, etc. That when we disobey, so in, in, at work, we have different sections or codes in the code of conduct. And so they would call it a violation of section three, code 12, or whatever it is. I don't know, I've never been busted on violating it, so, but nonetheless. As a side note, and we won't get into this very much in this um, this sermon, but it is very interesting to find that the fact that there seems to be a universal standard revealed by our conscience, in other words, pretty much everybody knows that they don't like being stole from. And so while they may ignore that and still steal from other people, they do it in the dark and in secret or lying. People don't like to be lied to. People don't like to be killed. People don't like to, you know, there's so that there is, and that's pretty much true of anybody that you meet worldwide apart from any societal connection or commonalities. So these are, these are universal, this is a universal standard that all human beings have, not that we necessarily live by them. And so this is evidence that there is a universal standard giver, i.e. God. So this is one of the strongest evidences for the existence of God, that each and every one of us has this, his, his fingerprint impressed on our own conscience. Now, we may live very hard and work very hard to blot that out and live contrary to it, but nonetheless, it is there. So, like I said, as a side note, this fact of this moral, universal moral standard is a very good piece of evidence for the existence of God itself. So, let's take a look at natural evil real quick. So, natural evil would be things such as earthquakes, severe weather, floods, plagues, forest fires, meteor impacts, animal attacks, auto accident, now auto accidents, falls, birth defects, etc. So these would be evils that can't at least seemingly be ascribed to the moral evil of humans. So there's no there does not seem to be at least in anything we can observe in in the physicality here um, a relationship with someone committing adultery with his neighbor's wife and the earthquake happening. There doesn't seem to be any direct connection. Not that there couldn't be, but not that we can observe and see. So that's natural evil. And we'll look at these in a little more depth a little later, later here. So those are a couple terms that we've covered. God, who is God, um, and what is evil. And we stuck to what is evil in the context of the definition of God that we've provided. So other people might throw in other things that are evil, like cutting down a tree to, you know, have a fire. I don't mean cutting down a whole forest, but cutting down a tree. Some people would call that evil. You know, some people would call making hamburgers and eating them evil. So that's that's their problem, nonetheless. So you don't have to eat hamburgers if you don't want, but don't call me evil when I do. So yeah, deforestation. Yes, I had that word in here and I took it out. So <laughs> so so one of the things, so we have we have God and we have evil and we understand that Essentially, evil causes suffering. I mean, that's really how we kind of define, especially natural evil, what, what can be, because natural evil can be somewhat subjective. One, you know, one natural event to somebody could be evil, and another, it could be a benefit. You know, floods uh, in a river, in, in the riverbed, can be detrimental to the people that live along the river, but the farmers that live downstream and, and off, you know, the tributaries get filled with water, and so their crops get watered. So to them, it's not evil. It's a good. So those are natural evils, again, can be subjective. So I want to cover a thing here, and then we'll get into the, the, the framework of the, the objection that many have against the existence of God because, of the, because evil exists. Um, is that one other attribute is that God hates evil and suffering. So the God that we have discussed, 
and the evil that we have discussed and the suffering that comes about as a result of that, God hates that. So let's read a few verses here. Psalm 4, Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5. For you are not a God that has pleasure in wickedness, neither shall, uh, shall evil dwell with you. The foolish shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity or evil. And in Isaiah 5, 20, we see woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them. God hates that. A couple more verses along those lines. Romans 12, verse 9. Uh, we see here, uh, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. So we are enjoined to abhor that which is evil, to hate evil, just like our Heavenly Father hates that which is evil. We're supposed to, to bear his image. Cleave to that which is good. In Revelation 21, verse 4, we see here that the, the promise held out to all who are his is a state where there is no more evil, there is no more suffering. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Um, and I didn't, I, so Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 is the one where the 16 that the Lord hates, yea, seven. So there are many examples, so I'm not going to read them, but if you want to look there on your own, that's fine. So God hates evil. So there is a God. There is such a thing as evil. Um, there is evil in the world. No one can deny that fact. Uh, and God hates evil. So before, before I say it now, have any of you heard anybody ask or say, how can I follow a God that would allow such evil to happen? Or similar, how can you follow such a God? How about, why doesn't God stop all the evil, pain and suffering that happens every day? Or maybe they're talking about specific instances. Why doesn't, why does God allow this? So, um, isn't all the evil in the world proof that God doesn't exist, at least a loving God? So these kind of statements, these are common. These are fair. This is how people think. These are not technical, but that's how they think. But technically, so this is where we're going to overlap a little bit with the Epicurean Dilemma because it's framed very well in a technical sense. And as I said earlier, um, I want to cover it from a more technical point of view, not because it makes us smart, but because it will help us understand what the underlying problem is here so that we can address it and help them. So the, the classical problem of evil argument is framed as such, and it's generally accredited to Epicurus. I think it's been around a lot longer than he was around, but nonetheless. Oh, oh wait, I forgot this one. Or, oh, this is an important one, actually. This is, Or maybe you have struggled with some of these questions within yourself. So not somebody else is asking or whatever. And I'll be honest, over over time, I mean, stuff is it's like, well, I don't know how to answer that. Well, how, what, what's going on there? So those are, we have to be honest with ourselves because if we're not honest with ourselves when we have questions, and maybe you haven't had a question on this line, and that's fine, you know, it's by the grace of God, that's all. But everyone has questions at times. Everyone has things, scenarios that happen in daily life that cause us to take a step back, at least mentally, and think, huh, well, I don't. I didn't see that coming. I don't know. How, how does that fit in with, and again, we may not think of it technically in that sense, but that's the net result of it. So these, these are questions that are very important that we are honest with, with ourselves first, with God also, and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why it's so important to have a, a local fellowship, a body that, you're, that you, you meet with regularly, that you can discuss these things with. Because, and especially today, in the last 10, 15 years or so, these kind of questions, they're a little Google search away. And what you're going to find on Google is everybody that's going to argue against God. They're going to give you all the evil explanations. They're going to draw you away from faith. They're going to attempt to draw you away from him. And that's where most people go when they have questions like this. And I'm not saying don't search things out. God is all powerful and God is good. But don't allow those who you don't even know to be the main purveyors and controllers of what you think in regards to God and who he is and how he would have you be. Don't do that. Don't. And if you have um, encountered a situation where you've had serious questions and you've gone to someone, 
for assistance, someone in the faith, and they have been obtuse or belligerent or belittling, like, I can't believe, well, then first and foremost, forgive them in your heart for that, certainly, and seek God and find someone else. Find someone else. God is there. So, And if you look through your own experience and you realize in time past someone has approached you with a question like this and you have not responded properly, then repent. And if there is still opportunity to reopen that conversation, actively do that. Actively do that. It is important. So now I'm going to go to the technical framing of this argument. Yes. So, essentially it breaks down like this. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. In other words, he's hateful. He's not loving. Is he both able and willing? Well, then why is there evil? If he can prevent it all, and he's willing to prevent it all, then why is there evil? And last, if he is neither able nor willing, then why would you call him God? If either he's not powerful enough to do what he wants, or he doesn't care, meh, then why do you call him God? And I agree with that last one. If he truly, if you are worshiping a being, which would be a fabricated imaginary being, that you call God that either is not powerful enough to bring about his own will within the proper context that we talked about, about being all powerful or a God that isn't willing because he just doesn't care and too bad. And, and that I would um, again, caution the Calvinist uh, doctrine because that essentially is what it is. The Calvinist doctrine, the pure Calvinist doctrine teaches that God just don't care about most of the people in the world. You don't care about them at all. You just creating them for firewood really is all it is that he cares about. And it's nothing you can do to change his mind on that whatsoever. Now, if you speak to someone individually who generally holds the Calvinistic ideas, they may not hold that specific line. So don't just assume they do, but it's a good point of discussion to start bringing out because they may just never have considered it. So don't assume just because somebody says I'm a Calvinist that they really understand the implications of that statement fully. So. Anyway, so this is the problem. So, okay, if there's so if there is this all-powerful God and he knows everything, so in other words, he could stop evil, and he knows everything, so in other words, he knows about all the evil that's happening, and he's all loving, in other words, he hates evil. Why doesn't he stop evil? And on its surface, apart from any real other understanding, it somewhat makes sense. It's not just a completely out of the blue argument or or you know logical chain. So just because someone has that that idea doesn't necessarily mean that they've fallen complete victim to foolishness. Little children um, out of the mouths of babes. I mean, how many, you know, why did mommy have to die, dad? Why did God let mommy die? For, you know, well, I mean, questions like that. that. That is kind of the nature. And those kind of questions, if they are not handled properly at the time, grow into full-fledged rejection of God. So this idea, again, as I said, this, 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 the framing of the argument in this fashion is generally attributed to Epicurus around 300 BC or so. Um, but wherever it comes from, it's definitely very common in today's think as well, both within the church and outside the church. And when I say within the church, I mean people who, who are still his, but they are having doubts. They don't know how to answer these things. And something has happened that's brought this to the forefront. And now they're, they're, they're confused because they don't know. They're not sure how to reconcile within themselves the truth of this. And they certainly don't know how to respond to someone else who comes to them with sincere concerns about it and ask them. That can also be a very, um, a very dangerous area for someone's faith if they feel cornered and almost like apologetic of the world, the world is this way. And I'm kind of sorry, God isn't doing what you, you know, I think God probably should be doing that. He shouldn't let this person be sick. 
And I'm sorry that the person's sick and I really don't know how to answer that. I mean, that's that that will, will, will eat at someone's faith as well. If you don't know, if you don't understand. Now, we may not be able to provide an answer that will satiate the suffering and grief of the person that's not a believer. But there certainly are ways that we can approach this to give those who truly are his, but just are, and we'll get into this a little later, are falling victim to this, some help to get pointed back in the right direction. So there's a word that uh, it's around 1797 was its origin. And up until very recently, I do not recollect ever having run across this word. But ever since I ran across, I noticed it and looked it up. It's like, it seems like it's everywhere. So I don't know what. <laughs> so I either just wasn't paying attention or what. But the word is theodicy. And so this uh, theodicy explains why an omnipotent, all good God allows evil. Essentially, it is it is a an argument that gives the reason why. And while you think it, while I would think it was an old word, I'm wondering wow. So I looked up like on Google, it shows like word usage over time, like how often you know. So actually, this word is big time on the uprise. That's like 2019. The chart ends at 2019. So it's uh, becoming more and more popular. Why? Because people have this question more and more. Why, why is there evil in the world? And more and more, this word is put into the mix. So people are running across it. So this, to not, more than the fact that the word theosity seems to become more popular, to me, just is more evidence that more and more people are asking this question. Why is there evil in the world? So let's take a look at a little bit more, a little more deeply at what theosity is. Because theosity, I believe, is a pipe dream. And it is not the way that we should go. So a theosity, a true theosity, provides one or more. It's a theodicy. Theodicy. Uh, uh, hopefully I spelled it correctly all the different places. So <laughs> a true theodicy provides one or more specific reasons for evil. Now let me give an example. And not in the sense of why does God allow evil, but just a, a, a theodicy. A theosity example. So here, here's one. So Joe orders a book, and he's notified that it's delivered. Yay. Upon arriving home, it's not there. Ugh, I know the feeling. So Joe assumes that it must have been stolen and rants to his neighbor, Bob, who happens to be standing nearby. So we see the flaw here in Joe's assumption. Now, it could have been stolen, and maybe he lives in a neighborhood where that commonly happens. So his jumping to that conclusion might not be entirely unreasonable, but nonetheless. However, Bob tells Joe that he saw Sally, Joe's wife, take the package inside, thus it wasn't stolen. So in this example here, this in this example, Bob provides a specific reason for the evil, the book ain't there, and the reason reveals that it isn't an evil after all. It wasn't really evil. It was just the fact that his wife took it in early. So this is a true theosity. This gives the exact specific reason why the book isn't there. And as a result of knowing that reason, we realize that when Joe jumped to the conclusion that it must have been stolen was incorrect and improper. So Joe would want to roll back from that. Okay, it hasn't been stolen. Sally got it. Okay, so this is, this is, in its purest sense, a theosity, the definition or a good example of a theosity. It provides a specific and exact reason for why this happens. Okay, and, and it's nice when you can have those things, you know, um, but life generally isn't that clean, and clear and clean cut. It's just not. Usually there's a lot more gray stuff going on. So since we don't actually know why God allows evil. Because there's no verse in the Bible that says, I, God, allow evil because blank. That doesn't mean that we can't have reasons why evil exists or why God might allow evil. We know that evil exists, and we believe the definition of God as we laid it out in the opening slides. And we know that, so the two cannot be contradictory to each other there must be some manner in which they can be reconciled, such as the fact that Sally took the book inside. But let's take a look at a different approach. Instead of a theosity, let's look at what we would call a defense. 
Okay, so it's another approach, not a theosity. So instead of attempting to provide the actual reason God allows evil, so we, since we don't certainly know it, we can provide a defense or an explanation. This defense will show it is possible that God is exactly who we have previously described and yet still allows evil. And again, for those who do not want to believe, this will be unconvincing. They're still going to not believe. They don't want to believe. It's not going to make anybody. But to those who are lost, searching for the blessed hope, this approach can be a godsend. It can help overcome intellectual blockage or so let's take a look at it as an example of this. So we'll use the same scenario. Joe ordered the book. He came home and it wasn't there. The difference here is that Bob, the neighbor, did not see Sally take the package in. However, Bob is still there, and Bob is concerned that Joe's rage will lead to no good. In a similar fashion, we believe that someone's rejection of God is not just some intellectual argument that they should accede to, that it will ultimately lead to no good. And so that's why it even matters that we would even approach this subject. If they believe that they don't want a chocolate milkshake, okay, all good. No, I'm not going to argue with it. There's no sense to argue. It's not. So here, the difference in this scenario is that there is no specific knowledge by anyone of what has happened. All they know is that the book was ordered, it was supposedly delivered, and it ain't where it's supposed to be. Okay. Come on, where's my mouse at? So instead of giving Joe a specific reason, because Bob doesn't know, he provides possible reasons. So let's take a look at some possible reasons here. So Sally took the package in. That's a possible reason. Um, another neighbor took it for safekeeping. Uh, the package is late and will be delivered tomorrow. The author of the book is signing it and will return it later. The book has temporarily shifted into a different dimension, but will soon shift back permanently. So, well, no, yes, we don't, we don't know which one it is. So, yes, right. I was going to do a cloaking generator, but it didn't fit. So, it's like I got <laughs> good ones, Linda. So, nonetheless, yes. So, yes, I, I kind of made a little fun here with some of the 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 reasons or the plausible possible reasons are somewhat ridiculous and fantastical generally you would not want to go there that's not going to be very helpful for bob, for joe to decide okay yeah maybe it really did shift into another dimension i should chill out bob or joe would look at bob and think you're nuts so he stole my book but these here so while 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 this does not provide the exact reason why the book is not there it provides possible reasons other than, than the book was stolen, that the book was not there. And some further investigation along these lines could perhaps yield the final result of finding the book. Go ask Sally. Go ask the neighbor. You know, so go to the other dimension, whatever it might be. So this is a defense. So here, a defense, as opposed to a theosity, um, provides possible reasons. Now, they should be reasonable reasons, but they're possible reasons. So if someone says, okay, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, he hates evil, and yet there's evil, so one of those other statements about God must be false, or he doesn't exist at all, that's essentially the same thing as jump, Joe's jumping to the conclusion, somebody must have stole it. That is one possible answer to that dilemma that God doesn't exist, or God isn't omniscient, or omnipresent, or omnipotent, or, or um, omnibenevolent. That is a possible answer, but we're going to look at some facts, and we're going to see that that is a very unlikely scenario. That is very similar to it shifted into another dimension type scenario, and we're going to look at that. So. So this example doesn't provide a specific reason, but it provides enough to show that Joe's assumption that the book must have been stolen is not reasonable. There are many possible scenarios that can explain the evil. So that's the difference, and we'll cover this again in review in a little bit. That's the difference for, between a theosity 
and a defense. And the reason that I even mentioned theosity is because there have over the ages been several theosities written um, that people have attempted to provide what they expect are the firm answer Sally took the book when they don't really know. So if we don't know exactly why there is evil in the world in, in, in the light of who God is, then we should look for reasonable possibilities why these two things are not contradictory to each other. And they can't just be out of the blue. So they essentially have to be morally sufficient reasons for evil. And we'll take a look at an example here in a minute. So they can't just be, well, because it's Tuesday. That could be, because we don't know why God allows evil. Either, yeah, it could be in a rant. So, yes, <laughs> could be Monday. We, but but that, that, that offering that as a possible reason why God has allowed evil or an evil probably doesn't, wouldn't really excuse him or, or give someone in their mind at least the, the pause, okay, maybe so. I mean, it's the same thing if you, if you asked your, if you arrived late to work and your boss says, well, why are you late? And you said, well, it's Tuesday. They would be, okay, I don't care that it's Tuesday. Now, if you said, if you said, um, you know, this, this, you know, today they had the drawbridge was stuck up because on Tuesdays, sometimes they do some repairs, but usually it's later in the morning. So I usually am across the bridge before it happens. Then your boss might be willing to accept that as a morally sufficient reason or excuse. And, and okay, I'll cut you some slack. But if you told your boss, well, I just didn't feel like coming in. Well, then probably he's not going to see that as morally sufficient. He's going to say, you're dinged, buddy. You're dinged. <laughs> Yes, you're dinged. All right, so here let's look at let's look at a, a an example. I think we kind of understand what a morally sufficient reason is, but let's take a look at it as an example here. All right, so you walk into a room where there's a person lying face down, unconscious, on a table, and standing over him is another man with a sharp knife in his hand, about to cut the unconscious man open. If the man with the knife is a surgeon, then all is good. But if he's his enemy, it's all is bad. So going on, actually, that should have been on a second slide. I kind of gave away the answer before. But nonetheless, so being cut open is never a good thing. If you have the option of being cut open or not being cut open, don't get cut open. That's never a good thing for any reason. However, there are circumstances in which the evil of being cut open can lead to a better good. Appendicitis, for example. In a couple months. I'm going to get corneal replacement surgery. So they're going to cut part of my eye open. I'm not looking forward to that. I don't, I would rather never have my eye cut open. I'm telling you, but, but, but the greater, the greater good of having my, my lens replaced so that I can see well out of the, my right eye is much, a much better thing than enduring the cutting in the eye, which has happened thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. So. So this would be a morally sufficient reason for the evil. The evil is getting cut open. You should never, if you had a choice, never get cut open. Don't. It's, the skin's not supposed to be cut. It's not intended to be cut. It heals if it does get cut, but it's not intended to get cut. But there are, at times, sufficient reasons why that could be. So with that in mind, um, our, our little home group here, not, on, not folks online necessarily, but a couple weeks ago, we looked at a little, some little slides from a, an author that uh, that kind of delves into some of this stuff. And one of the areas, so he does a little thing. And so J. Warner Wallace is his name. And he has a nice little sketch of some, what I believe are potentially valid reasons to exp morally sufficient reasons that would explain why God is who he is and yet evil still exists in the world. They are not, this is not a theosity. This is a defense. This is not intended to be an and all be all list. Um, and so I kind of took his graphic because it's good. And then I'm going to just go into each one sort of and explain it. So evil 
sort of these are different these are different potential or possible reasons why God may per, may allow evil either in a specific instance or in the general sense of just evil in the world. Now, are is any one of them true? Absolutely no. And is any one of them the drop the mic answer to it? No, it depends on the situation. So for example, like the one, the accurate view of eter eternity. So actually I do have some, so each one of these, I'm, I've got one slide that's just kind of answers that you might give to someone, not quoting Bible verses at them. And then I have a slide or two of Bible verses along the same line. So we'll go into each one of those in a minute. But for example, an accurate view of eternity. So his defense mainly was, he believes that everybody, no matter what, you know, they're like a, if, a, if a fetus is aborted, that they're going to go to heaven automatically. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, God is, a, that's, he's the boss of that. So I'm not going to, I can't say that. I'm not going to say, so, so some of the stuff, I wouldn't think that necessarily would be the best, but it depends. Another thing that before we dig into these is that a much better time to begin to broach this topic with someone who is questioning is not when they're in the midst of grief and pain. Because then emotionally, it's going to be much more difficult to accept these things. The better time to do this is when you're in the teacher's lounge with them. If you go to the teacher's lounge, or if you're at the coffee shop, or if you're at the, you know, the break room at work, or if you're, you know, whatever it might be, or if you're on a, a, a call with them, that's a much better time to begin to broach this subject. Remember that you don't necessarily, you don't have to like close the deal on the first discussion. You want to just kind of help them see, oh yeah, maybe, you know, at first glance, it looked like the Epicurean dilemma made sense. It's like, yeah, well, God either can exist or he's not all that. Or there wouldn't be evil, but nah, there maybe there are reasons why both could be true. So let's take a look at the first one, accurate view of eternity. So I actually didn't take Jim's most for the most part here, and he didn't have any scriptures listed in his because Jim's main focus is the people who either have rejected the Bible because the heart is a heart, or they don't know it. So they're not going to hold the Bible as authoritative. So so I kind of have both here. I have these types of comments that might be with someone who you wouldn't necessarily talk with on biblical terms. And then I'll have some verses also for along the same line. So the accurate view of eternity. So what he means here is the hope. Uh, there is hope of eternity beyond what seems to be a veil of tears that this life offers sometimes. If you have that focus. Life is not a veil of tears. But there are times when grief comes upon us and it is difficult. Eternity in comparison to a short time of suffering is a pretty good deal. Knowing, where, uh, knowing there is a reward doesn't stop grief from being grief, from being heavy, but it makes the load lighter and the destination is sure. So uh, I just think about that when I was in basic training, you know, and we were doing all the, all the road marches and the runs and everything. And it's like the worst was when you didn't know when it was going to end. When they wouldn't tell you, oh, we're going to march five miles, or we're going to march to this point. That was the word. If you knew, at least, then you could kind of set your mind, okay, we're closer. We're, are we there? You know, that's, you could, when you didn't know, that was the worst. That made it, but you still had to soldier on. So nonetheless, having an accurate view of eternity, the proper perspective Many Christians are accused, and many Christians actually hold this view, and I always have to watch myself that I don't hold it also, that, that we can become so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly use. In other words, we just think, well, why are you worried about anything that happens here? It's all temporary. It's all going to go away. Nothing matters. I'm, I'm, destined for, I'm destined for glory and eternity. So, so what that your, that your mom passed away? So what that this happened? You know, it's 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 easy to well no i mean that but it's we have to and that's somewhat of an extreme example but we can have shades or flavors of that that aren't quite as extreme or noticeable so we have to always watch and pay attention to our own heart in this that while we do have to have a a correct perspective on the relationship between this life and what it contains not just evils but the joys also because the joys can be equally or even more dangerous to draw us away from him than the evils can but nonetheless, to have a proper perspective between what we are gifted here in this life and what we are promised in eternity. Todd, uh, Todd was out here this last week, Todd Palmer from Michigan, and uh, he and I were talking, 
uh, earlier this week about this. There's very little in Scripture about what eternity is going to be like. It's not, it doesn't really tell us much at all other than it's going to be forever. So we, we don't know. I do think that one thing that is commonly held by Christians that doesn't seem to make sense, and we'll get into the uh, idea of free will a little later here, but there will be no more sin. There'll be no more death or unhappiness, suffering in, in eternity. But I don't, it does not seem congruous with the way God has created everything else up to this date, including the angels and us, that there will be no free will in eternity that we essentially can't choose to reject him. The angels chose. So I'm not saying that will be, but I'm saying that I think we, we just because it says that there'll be no more sin, because we won't sin. And we won't have, our mind won't be warped and twisted. We won't have, no longer have influence either in our own heart or from the world or from the enemy to draw us away and deceive us and trick us to think that, oh, this piece of fruit is really what you want to eat. But nonetheless, the angels, at least as far as we know, Satan and his minions, they did not, ha they, they chose at some point to disobey God. So however that works out, I just am saying that we know very little about eternity. And, and I think that that is another, uh, another defense or another argument for the doctrine that uh, against greasy grace, because if you have no true heart today, to seek him, to obey him, to love him, then why would we possibly think that just because we get a body that lives forever, that that would change? What possible reason would you think that? So that being said, let's read a couple verses here about an accurate view of eternity. Isaiah 25, verse 8, He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And in Revelation 22, verse 3, we read here, And there shall be no more curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and we shall be his servants and shall serve him forever. So there's just a couple um, biblical examples of to help put in perspective eternity as compared to this life. Not that this life is a curse. This life is a gift from God. It is. Even with the evil that's in it, this life is a gift. It's a gift that we can enjoy and a gift that we can use to grow in his image and glorify him. Another uh, possible explanation or reason that evil exists in light of God's characteristic and who God is, is evil as a consequence so sometimes our suffering is a result is a result of our own actions. We know that, in fact, probably a lot of times. Uh, we suffer sore joints because we took poor care of ourselves when we were young. We suffer financial difficulty because we were lustful with our spending, running up credit card debt, etc. So in other examples, anybody got any other examples of things like this? I'm sure you do. I'm not asking for confessions. <laughs> but, okay. We're going to actually, so like I said, I'm going to cover some of these potential reasons and a few other things, but I by no means think it's end all be all. And I, I'm, I'm going to try to address what I think of are, are the, <clears throat> are the common questions that people might have, but I certainly, I'm sure there are other questions that may be common that I've missed or not aware of. So at the end, I'm going to have a little Q and a, if somebody has something else, you know, another question that I didn't cover or another point that I didn't that we can bring that out. So I see, uh, Someone posted in here, so I'll cover that, uh, Clayton, uh, later towards the Q&A. So he's got a little what if there. So thank you for that. So evil as a consequence. So let's read a few verses. Job 4.8 here we see, Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness, they reap the same. Uh, Proverbs 22.8, And he that sows iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. And in Galatians 6, verse 8, for he that sows to his flesh shall to his flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So sometimes the suffering, the evil that we, we experience is a result of our own disobedience, um, a, a consequence of our own disobedience, or a consequence of the disobedience of others. A drunk driver might, you know, drive into, say, was a, 
um, you know, and kill somebody. There was uh, just in uh, Wheeling earlier this week, those four, those four kids from Buffalo Grove High School died. I mean, they were just out. It was like 1030 at night and the kid was just driving too fast and not paying attention, apparently. And he and the three people that were in the car with him all died. I mean, that's that's horrible. That's awful. Did you know, was was he was he being foolish? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but but he didn't deserve that. And neither the path, not in that sense there nonetheless but those are the kind of things that that people struggle with they can't reconcile that with a, a god that is all powerful all knowing all present and all loving and and we as christians while we may still at times struggle with the grief and difficulties that life has in it we should be able to provide assistance for those who are really looking for it not arguments with people who just want to argue and reject god Another possible uh, reason why evil may exist in light of God's existence and characteristics is that evil has the power to draw. So most people don't think twice when things are going well. The good life fills our focus, and we have little time need, seemingly, to stop and wonder just why the roses do smell so sweet. We just love the smell of them, and we're digging it, so we're going. But let a little tragedy, a little suffering enter, and it may prompt someone, maybe for the first time, to consider the bigger questions about life and its purpose. So this is another possible scenario where a greater good could come from an evil. We all have had things like this occur in our life, small and large probably, similar to the allowing someone to cut you open because if you don't, your appendix is going to kill you. Let's take a look at... Uh, a couple examples here. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. It's better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and living way, uh, the living will lay this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, if laughter is being used as a mask for what's really going on. Uh, if, if you have the opportunity to experience laughter and sorrow, and you will hold fast to God, in either case, take laughter. Laughter is more enjoyable. It is. Nobody in, likes when there is grief, nonetheless. But often grief can help us get back on the path or get on the path for the first time. Another scriptural example of the power to draw, Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. And the children of Israel did, and, oh, this is Judges, not Jeremiah, Judges. And this is just one example. You go through, Brian covered Judges a few um parts ago in his understanding the bible series so there's a recurring theme in judges i picked this one here so the children uh, did evil in sight of the lord um therefore he punished them he sold them into the hand of the king of mesopotamia i'm not even going to try to pronounce that um and then and and they served the mesopotamia under bondage for a while and then the children of israel cried unto the lord it drew them the, the misery and the suffering drew them back to the lord um and he raised up a deliverer, and he delivered them. So evil, suffering, has the power to draw. So that is a possible, morally sufficient reason why evil can exist. Because the final outcome is better than, or, or greater, much greater than the evil, the temporary evil. Another uh, reason is character development. It's similar to draw, but a little different. So no pain, no gain. We've all heard that expression there. Uh, difficulties in life, self-imposed or otherwise, provide an opportunity to learn and grow. And just as the butterfly must struggle out of the chrysalis to become, be able to fly, difficult times provide similar opportunities for us. They can build our character. Um, and it's Calvin and Hobbes. I love this. So it's like this is one of the, the recurring themes throughout the Calvin and Hobbes cartoons, if you're familiar with them. But it's... Calvin would object to whatever his dad was having him do. And uh, one of his common responses was it builds character. So here it's the, ah, we get a snowblower. I don't like shoveling no more. It's like it builds character. So that may not be entirely true, but nonetheless, the idea is we, we know sometimes enduring difficulty and going through hard times or going through training, like, you know, for a sport or for, you know, for a soldier going through training, um, and during that difficulty 
can yield great results that would not necessarily have been yielded if we had not had the difficulty that we had to press through to begin with. A few verses here. Hebrews 12, 6, and 7. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure, cha if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? And skipping down to verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. So suck it up. Look, just go through it. You can get through it. Hebrews, or I mean, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us that we, we have not endured temptation that isn't common to mankind. And that in every case, every difficulty, every grief that comes along, he always provides an avenue of escape, an avenue to grow through, no matter what it is. And so that's essentially what the writer to Hebrews here is saying. Uh, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Another morally sufficient reason that evil exists, a potential reason, is that people's definition, so this goes back to the omnibenevolent that I talked about before, where people twist that. So they decide what love means, and since God's expression of love doesn't match what they believe it should, then they accuse God. So, so a, the proper definition of love is one possible morally sufficient reason why evil would exist. So apart from the influence of God's prevailing spirit, most of us revert to the base idea of love. If it makes me happy, it's love. If not, then not love. I mean, it really is. You know, that's our definite, and, and as long as it doesn't infringe on my happiness too much, I'm willing to say, okay, if you love other stuff, go for it. Have a good time. Just don't mess with my stuff. Our definition of love has been deeply compromised by the way it is portrayed in contemporary novels and movies. Love is far more than sentimentality, romance, or affection. For example, loving parents may allow a dentist to inflict temporary pain on their child for long-term good. Again, that's loving. But from a certain point of view, you would think, well, why are you going to let that guy stick needles in your kid and drill on their mouth? And everything? it's like, you know, that's horrible. But that's not unloving. A couple verses here. John 15, 12 through 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, we read, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, I don't have it on the screen there, but John 15, 10. If you love me, keep my commandments, for example. So God's definition of love is very clear, um, but it doesn't always necessarily make us feel well in the short term, at least just like going to the dentist. But if you've been dealing with a toothache for for months and months, when you finally get relief from that, believe me, it's very nice. So just as we talked about um, that the reasons that we provide, the potential reasons we provide should be um, at least morally sufficient reasons, They're not just because it's Tuesday kind of reasons. Uh, the idea of free will also, because animals, uh, animals have some measure of free will, it seems. I don't, it doesn't see, I don't think there's no evidence that God is completely dictating their behavior. Or they, they can decide to go lay down in the front room or go bark in the backyard or whatever they want to do. Um, so they do have some measure of free will and, and they can decide to obey your commands or disobey your commands, but it's not a morally significant free will. So that's what we're going to talk about here. So free will. So another um, morally sufficient reason for the existence of evil is the fact that people have a morally significant free will. In other words, um, I got the right. And so 
Real love requires the, so this is one possible reason. People say this is a reason. I, I don't, I mean, scripture doesn't tell me this exactly. So, so real love requires the ability to not love. Even the sin twisted world we live in knows that you can't force someone to love you. Rational thought and action require freedom to be able to choose and, uh, and not always what is right. And a world without the ability to act freely would seemingly be one populated by robots. So I can't conceive of a world in which I could not choose to love or not love, be anything other than a world that's populated by a bunch of robots. But there might be some such world. I just can't think of it. Nonetheless, remember, we're not trying to say that these are the exact reasons why. These are reasonable, possible reasons why. And so since we believe that God, we are created in God's image and we have the ability to choose that there that if we were, did not have the ability to choose, we would be such as a beast, an animal that is created in God's image. Um, let's see here, I got my notes covered. So, so we have to have the ability. So free will is one of the reasons, morally sufficient reasons, why why evil would exist because. God has created, and it would not, God has created a world in which humans, people, have the ability to choose to do evil. That he, so it would be logically impossible for the him to create a world where people could choose to do evil and yet not allow them to choose evil. That would be logically incompatible. That's like making a, a rock too heavy that he couldn't lift it or a square circle. You can say it in words. It's just like, a, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with M.C. Escher. He's an artist, it's long since dead. I should have had one of his arts. I've used him in, in sermons in the past. So he's very good at drawing optical illusions, things that can't really exist. If you look at it on paper, it looks like they make sense, but they're like stairways that go this way, and then they're going down at the same time, and people are walking sideways. So any little segment of the of the image looks like it makes sense, but taken in total, it would be physically impossible that such an object would exist, even though you could draw it on a two-dimensional piece of paper. So it's the same thing. We can we can type things out in words, but just because we can express something in words does not mean that it actually logically could exist. And it's not because God lacks power to be able to do it, but it's not possible. So a couple verses here along those lines. Genesis 2, verses 16 through 17, we see here. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of it. Because in the day you eat of it, you're going to die. And in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. I don't have it on the screen, but the Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we'll choose the Lord. These are examples of being able to make moral choices between right and wrong, good and evil. From the very beginning in the garden, they had that choice. They had the ability to make a moral choice. A couple more uh, scriptural examples here. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing therefore choose life that both you and your seed may live choose it choose life as opposed to choosing death galatians 5 13 for brethren you have been called unto liberty and use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another so obviously we have the ability to choose this liberty to use it incorrectly or for evil So I think this next one, to me, is probably one of the most universally applicable possible reasons myself, and it is limited understanding. We don't know everything. In fact, we know very little. A child is not able to understand many of the reasons for the evil their parents perpetrate on them almost daily, it seems. So from the child's point of view, all they do is just tell me what I can't do. I want to do this, I can't do it. Do that. 
I want to go play in the street. I want to follow that little yellow. They just painted that little yellow line down. I want to go see if it's still wet. You know, it's like, whatever. Parents are a bunch of buzzkills, but they're not. We understand that. They just don't understand. And they can't, they can't necessarily, even if we try to explain to them, they couldn't necessarily grasp it. A soldier understands only a small part of the battle plan. A cantini, um, the cantini armory down, I don't know where it's at. I mean, I know where it is, but I don't know what city it's in, but it's somewhere. Wheaton, Wheaton. So that place is, I like that place. I've only been there a couple of times, but they, so it's a World War II, World War II thing. And they, they take you through and they kind of tell you about all the plans for the invasion of Normandy and how every little piece. So, so nobody, nev, nobody knew the whole plan. Not, nobody even I mean, nobody knew the whole plan. So everybody knew their little piece. And it was very important that each each piece performed its part so that the whole plan would occur. And, and it's amazing how intricate it was. And it's amazing that it ever worked. And what's even more amazing is that it wasn't discovered, at least at a level that was enough so that they could counter counter it and, and, and raise a defense in time. I think there probably were some people on the enemy that knew about it, but it was too late and they weren't able to react quick enough. So, I mean, that's amazing considering all the coordination that had to happen. And it was just right across the channel. It was right there. So it's not like, so anyway, a soldier only knows a small part of the battle plan. And, and a good soldier understands that. And while, while the, the, the officers and, the, and the, the NCOs and the commanders in the military are human and they're fallible and they have their own, they have their own problems that ultimately roll down and the, and the soldiers suffer for. Ultimately, a soldier has to just trust that the chain of command knows what they're doing and I got to pay attention to what my job is and do it. I don't need to know what the rest of the plan is. And in fact, if I did know what the rest of the plan is, I'd probably mess it up because there's no way I could grasp the whole thing. And then I would think, oh, well, if I did this instead of that. So we don't know what God's plan is. What minute purposes he is working out through our suffering. But we can know, since he is who he is, that it is always just for good and for the best. So we may not know the specifics about why is this thing happening. We can know that it is he who is in control of it. It is he who is dictating that it happen, and it is he that will use this thing here <coughs> for our good and for his glory. A couple of verses here. Limited understanding, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, here's an example uh, with Joseph. But as for you, you thought evil against me. And we don't really know what, what Joseph thought about it. I don't, it doesn't really tell us what he felt about that. It doesn't say he was mad at him or happy about it or just it just happened to him. So it just unfolds to Joseph. So we don't know if Joseph was terrified or angry at his brothers at the time or whatever but nonetheless whatever whatever joseph thought he didn't know at that time i don't think scripture doesn't make say that he that he knew well i know this is happening but that's because i'm going to sit at the right hand of pharaoh and i'm going to save him he didn't know that when when he was thrown down on the well he didn't know that when they sold him off to the ishmaelite slave traders so but at this time joseph is able to say you thought evil against me but god meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. So the difficulty that Joseph endured for several years um, in the house of Potiphar and the false accusation by Potiphar's wife, and then the time in jail. And so he endured all that, maybe not even knowing, just as there's no evidence that Job understood why he was enduring what he was enduring, but he endured it. And in all that, Job sinned not with his tongue. And as far as we know, in all that, Joseph sinned not with his tongue as well. So, limited understanding. So here, one more quote. So there's, a, I actually ran across a, where'd it go? I had a, a book recently. Actually, this is the, I was reading a, an article online that 
quoted or cited this book and that's the word that's where i first saw theosity <laughs> so i got the book <laughs> so so i got the it's a good book um and it was written in the 70s and it, it actually is a very it's kind of heady but it's a very good um defense against this idea of evil god you know god freedom and evil by alvin plantina i'm not sure how to is it how to pronounce that last name but it might be Maybe it's Plantini, like Cantini or Cantini. I don't know. But anyway, so um, he's still alive. I could ask him, I guess. But So this is a quote from his book here uh, that I thought talked about limited understanding fairly well. I've got a couple more quotes from him coming up here. So why suppose that if God does have a good reason for permitting evil, the theists, in other words, the Christian, those who believe in God, um, would be the first to know? Perhaps God has a good reason, but that reason is too complicated for us to understand. Or perhaps he has not revealed it for some other reason that we can't even think of. So as we, I've listed these different possible reasons, that might, the, the fact that evil exists might be for an entirely different reason that I haven't even thought of or that nobody has even thought of. It could be. The theist believes that God has a reason for permitting evil. He doesn't know what that reason is. But why should that mean that his belief is pro improper or irrational? So when, when, when your thoughts get stuck on that, wow, why is this happening? Or if someone asks you, you may not at first blush know how to respond, but first and foremost, don't let it make you think that your belief, your faith is improper or irrational. Just because there is a set of circumstances, a scenario in the real world that we have never particularly thought on and we can't readily come up with a possible explanation or an explanation of why this is happening. So those, those reasons, I think for the most part, those are all centered on moral evil either committed by ourselves or committed by others they they at least give a reasonable um explanation or possible explanation of why that the evil can exist but i don't think that they really address natural evil very well earthquakes and things like that so i'm gonna i'm gonna add that in there it wasn't on the graphic but and i'm not a good enough artist to try to squeeze it in there and make it look the same so <laughs> natural evil we'll talk about a little bit here so here and actually i'm gonna i'm gonna Take some more quotes here from Alvin, the non-chipmunk guy. So evil that can't seemingly be ascribed to the free will actions of humans. So that's natural evil that we're talking about. On the one hand, it is conceivable that some natural evils and some persons are so related that the persons would be pr produce less moral good if the evils had been absent. So for example here, some people deal creatively with certain kinds of hardship or suffering, acting in such a way that on balance, the whole state of affairs is valuable. So in other words, he's saying, some people perform better under pressure. So when there's trouble, when there's problems, some people respond very well to that, and the ultimate end result is very good. Whereas if that trouble had not existed, they might have just stayed home and watched TV instead. And so then the ultimate, the very good thing would not have happened. So that's, what, that's the point he's making here. So that's one possible explanation why natural evil, why there would be a tornado, you know, and then someone is like, oh, I need to go help my neighbors, you know, and then, so then some very good comes out of it or some other thing or whatever. Um, that's one possible that he puts forth here. Now, the next one here um, is put forth that he cites is put forth by Augustine. This is a more traditional line of thought. Um, which is indicated by St. Augustine, who attributes much of the natural evil we find to Satan or to Satan and his cohorts outside that of which is as a result of God's punishment, because we know that does happen sometimes too. God does punish people using natural events. Um, but very seldom are we aware that that is the reason for a natural event. Uh, people try to posit that and try to put that forth um, when natural disasters happen, but my question always with that, okay, the hurricane hit New Orleans almost 20 years ago really severely. And was did New Orleans have a lot of people that sinned in it? Yes, but so does Chicago. So does Woodstock. <laughs> so does McHenry. 
So does Benton, Kentucky. <laughs> so why not there then? So that doesn't it doesn't seem to be a plausible. Could it have been? Yes. I mean that's but nonetheless. So this uh so these are these are in addition to the the defense the seven defenses that I gave earlier, um I think these help explain to a certain extent natural evil because while people think now that maybe man can cause earthquakes um back in the day earthquakes were a natural event humans had no ability to cause earthquakes so they were natural events and we see no specific example or um evidence that this earthquake happened because this person did this morally wrong thing so certainly there are um natural evils that happen as a result of immoral human actions like deforestation for example you, know, you tear down a whole forest and then you get mudslides and everything and so you know havoc happens so certainly there are um you, you you build a nuclear plant and you dump a bunch of nuclear waste in a river and then you get fish with three eyes and all kinds of stuff and people get sick you know yep cancers and everything so those certainly are are caused, those are natural evils that are caused by human immor immoral actions, but there are certainly natural evils that we see at least no evidence that they are caused by. Um, one of the, uh, along the line of this defense is, is that uh, um, Satan is, well, he's not all powerful, he certainly is very powerful, and his minions are powerful, and by the act of obedience, that Adam and his wife gave to him, he has assumed authority over this earth to a very great extent. And so he certainly could cause earthquakes. I would imagine he's probably powerful enough to do that or create tsunamis and things. Didn't he? I think in Job, didn't he sent the whirlwind that knocked down their house, the son's houses, right? And that's, I mean, so he used weather to do that, for example. And then he sent armies of enemies to go kill servants and take their flocks and their animals. So. So those are just, again, all that whole set of seven possible defenses for the existence of evil in light of God being the God that Christianity believes in. Um, and the couple examples that I gave here in regards to natural evil are all, I believe, reasonably plausible, morally significant possibilities to explain why the seeming disparity. So, and then just a quick refresher. Between the two here, between the Odyssey and a defense. So Augustine, the one that I was just reading here, he's, prevent, he's presenting what he thinks is a theodicy. Augustine and others who have um, believed along his lines believe that that is the specific reason why natural evil occurs because Satan is going around and causing all of it. I don't believe necessarily we can conclusively say that that is why. It is a plausible reason, but it is not why. So he believes that in fact, natural evil, except when it can be attributed to God's punishment, is to be ascribed to the activity of beings that are free and rational, but not human. So Satan and his minions. So he believes that is the reason. It is a, it is a theod theodicy. Um, the defense, of course, does not assert that this is fact. He says only that the, the defender, so the theist, the defender, he says only that it is possible. He points to the possibility that natural evil is due to the actions of significantly free but non-human persons. So you see the difference again. I want to emphasize that because I think it's important. I when I ran across this term of, of the Odyssey, it it helped me because I always in the back of my mind thought, well, you're presuming an awful lot about God and why things are because you don't really know that. So this kind of helps. It, it kind of clears that guilt away of like, well, I'm not saying this is why. I'm saying these are possible, reasonable things that it could be why. So I don't have to. And so why does that matter? Why is it important uh, a defense as opposed to a theodicy? I think I'll pronounce that a few different ways, but theodicy is the correct pronunciation. So I saw Brian over there mouthing it. So, <laughs> so some 
Some theodicies and defenses limit God. They make him less than what Scripture reveals he is. So we were looking into this earlier this week, Brian and Todd and I, and so one of the, one of the other approaches to this is uh, called open theism. And so in that defense, they essentially say that God doesn't really know everything. So he doesn't know that people are going to commit evil. So he's not to blame for it because he don't know. So those there are many such other approaches. And so that's why I said at the beginning that it's important that we define the terms and we stay with that, that if we use some other definition of God, like he doesn't know everything, then the whole argument is out the window. Then you can essentially say, well, God only worries about this on Tuesdays, whatever it might be. So, and in an attempt to provide a specific reason why evil exists, some aspect of God or his creation must be altered to match. And the real danger in this is that as a result of trying to tailor away from what scripture clearly reveals about God or his creation, false doctrines get created. And as a result of false doctrines getting created, divisions occur within the body. And so the desire to know exactly why God does what he does has led to untold numbers of false doctrines and divisions within his body, many turning into full heresy. And it's true. It really is. And I believe that the the motivation is to try to find some drop the mic you cannot there is absolutely no argument you mr god hater that never wants to believe in god you have to believe this argument no there is no such thing there is no such thing so from my point of view i believe that god has not provided us with a specific answer why evil in general exists in the world, nor does he, for most cases, provide a specific reason why specific evils occur. We don't really know. We don't know why Evelyn was born with a deformed heart. I don't, we don't know in, in specific why that happened. An attempt to explain that will lead down a path that is not godly. So there are some other objections, just a couple here I'll cover. There are many more. Um, God should let it, here's some, one would object and say this. I've had people say this to me too, quite angrily. Um, well, as I've discussed with them, well, maybe, you know, you don't know the whole picture. And I've been, someone angrily said back to me, well, God should let us know what his purpose is. Why didn't he tell us? So, well, actually, in reality, he has given in sufficient detail and which we've covered in previous slides and other places, um, but you don't want to listen. So he has provided sufficient reason why things are the way they are. Or another one that kind of goes back to the earlier slide, but God should just get rid of evil. And again, a possible reason why he would not do that is that if he would get rid of evil, he'd have to wipe you out and me too. So he'd have to get rid of all of us. All who have committed sin, he'd have to get rid of. So... These are just a couple other objections that, and remember, go back to the thing that, actually, the next slide kind of covers it and summarizes it again here. So when the agnostic or atheist reject God on the basis of evil, this leaves them in a pitiful spot. They have no hope in this evil-filled life. Their rejection of God doesn't make the evil and suffering go away. They simply must accede that the evil happens. Too bad, so sad eat, drink, and suffer, for tomorrow they die. That really is that, that when someone comes to this conclusion that the, this world's just messed up and it's for no reason whatsoever, it just is the way it is and there ain't nothing that can be done about it and there is no purpose whatsoever in it, then how can you draw anything else? And that doesn't mean that people who claim to be agnostic or atheists can't do good moral things. doesn't mean they can't be kind, friendly people. I've met some of those. Most of the real staunch atheists that I've met, though, are pretty bitter and pretty unkind and uncaring. But it doesn't mean they have to be. They're not mutually exclusive. But they ultimately, if they are able to find some measure of happiness and hope in life, 
is because they've mostly just stuck their head in the sand about a great deal of what they've observed of reality. In many cases, the rejection of God, because he doesn't stop evil, is based in some traumatic event or events in the past. And it really is common, especially people who are staunchly bitter against God. Um, he didn't save my mom. I prayed. I mean, I was eight and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and my mom died from cancer anyway. You know, or this or or my, my uncle was abusing me uh, and I prayed every night. I prayed and it didn't stop for six years. He did that to me and it didn't. God didn't stop nothing. You know, those, that's, those are horrible things. They're awful things. There are answers for those. But it's based in, and, and so the, the, the approach that the atheist takes, though, in rejecting the hope that is in God and the, so the answer to why evil that is in God rejects, even though they hate these things because of what happened to them, they reject the very thing that will actually give them freedom and peace from that and let them heal from that. So they need this. And well, I don't think anyone here, I'm not sure about online, perhaps, but uh, I don't know if anyone was a staunch atheist, but I'm sure that all of us have stubbornly held on to things that were not good for us for far too long a time. And we and others have suffered as a result of holding on to these things that God was prompting us and telling us that we needed to let go of. And as a result, we suffered but ultimately, hopefully, we do let go of them and allow his grace and his peace and mercy to flow back into us and flow back out of us, that we be forgiven of those things and we be healed of them. And that very same hope is what some of these people might actually be open to receiving if they can see, wow, it does make sense. So the Christian, on the other hand, has a reasoned, faithful approach that provides real hope and an understanding that there is a purpose in evil suffering and loss, even if we don't know specifically what it is. This is the very hope that those who have, heard, uh, have never heard or have lost their faith need. And it is one of the reasons it is so important for those who have this hope to actively share it in a world that increasingly needs it. So a few more slides. We're getting close there. Um, so this is just the same slide here. These are the seven uh, morally sufficient reasons that we went over, plus we went over the natural, natural evil as well a little bit. So we can see that there's certainly, and, and this is by no means an exhaustive list or even a list that might be um, useful in any given situation. But I, I, I hope that this is at least... Um, stirred people's appetites enough to think about what are people's questions and so that's why i'd like to hear you know if there are other if you think there's some other defense that is a good one that you've heard or, or was told to you or whatever at the end the q a which will be coming up soon that we can cover so we we talked about the defense and it's it's not based in definitively knowing this is the reason why evil exists either on the grand scale or specifically but more focused on these are possible reasons that show that the book wasn't really stolen, essentially. But there are some things we do know. And that's good. And so let's take a look at those. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I have the New Living Translation on the screen here. So what we do know, we do see in Jesus, who for a little while was given in a position a little lower than the angels, and because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. For whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So here's an example. We know that God chose this means to bring us into him that he chose the means of the brutal murder of his son and raising him three days later, later as the means by which we could be reconciled to him. He died for us when we were yet sinners. We know this. 
we know that God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And we know that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we know these things. We've talked about some of them. So why does this matter? Why is it important? Let's take a look at 1 Peter 3.15. We're told to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We're supposed to be ready. We don't need to know the answer to every single question. We don't have to be clever. We don't have to be coy. We can oftentimes, if we are just willing to earnestly listen and compassionately respond, sometimes we may not know the answer. We might have to you know, respond to something like, wow, I never have thought of that before. Let me, let me pray on that and look into that a little bit or whatever it might be. So we don't need, but, but to be able to earnestly and compassionately respond when people ask, well, what's the reason for the hope that it's in you? Matthew 18, 12, how think you, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them gone astray, does he not leave the 90 and nine and go into the mountains and seek that which has gone astray? Because those who are against themselves, God loves. And he's, he'll, he'll leave those who are secure in him for a while. <laughs> because sheep tend to stray, so just like we do. Um, but nonetheless, for that one, for the one, for that stupid little sheep that went off on his own. That, that uh, video I played, I don't remember what, what sermon it was, where that one, I was amazed at this, that sheep went down in the hole. He just went down in the hole. And, and, and the guy had to pull him out, and, it was, and the sheep was almost fighting him when he pulled him out. And so the guy gets him pulled out, and the sheep right back in the hole. Again, right back. What's well, like, what? what? Like, I don't ever do that. I never went in a hole like that, but nonetheless, I have, I have my own holes. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Why does it matter? 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 through 26, and again from the NLT. Did I not go on those slides there? I guess I didn't. I didn't. I, I read them off of my notes here. So we covered this, 1 Peter 3.15 and Matthew 18.12 and now 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 through 26. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. So this isn't a matter of just trying to, you know, be able to fight and argue with people and win arguments. That doesn't do anybody any good. In fact, we're told not to do that. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone and able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Think about the Apostle Paul. Now, none of us are, the Apostle Paul was called to a special office. He was an apostle. We're none of us are apostles. That doesn't mean we have no responsibility to follow these commands, but I do understand that he had a special gifting that not everyone has. Uh, but at the same time, he went, he actively went places. And when he got there, he went into the center of the storm. He'd go right into the synagogue where he knew that there would be trouble, where he knew there would be people that wanted to argue and fight, where he knew that actually the, the environment in places like that was exactly like this. It was intellectual. It was to, oh, this, you know, this little nuance and this little gnat they wanted to talk and argue about. And yet he went in there willingly and lovingly because he cared about the people that were in there. And he knew many of them wouldn't listen to him. And in fact, more than not listen to him, they would stone him and try to kill him and speak evil of him. And he did the same thing with the pagans when he went in Athens, when he went and he preached. You know, or or when uh, when he told when he told the spirit in the the woman uh, to leave, and then the, their they lost all their money and stuff. So it was he understood that he was willing to take risk because of them. So we also should, but we should willing be willing to gently instruct those who oppose the truth. And finishing off in verse twenty six, why perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to the sense, their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. So I don't know about any of you,
but I am not a discerner of other men's hearts. Not. I, I don't know. So I can't decide just because they have said, you know, I, I don't believe in God. Now, if they want to argue and fight back and forth, we're not supposed to argue with them. Okay, that's fine. But we can't just decide because it seems hopeless and it seems like, or it seems like it's a lot of work and I don't want to do it because it is. That, well, I'm not going to say nothing. What if Paul had decided, <laughs> I got myself on the road to Damascus. I'm good to go now, man. Scales are going off my eyes. I'm, I'm going back and kicking back in Jerusalem. You know, I'm going to just, what, what if Paul, for example, again, we're not Paul, but to a, to a certain extent, we are Paul. We are, we are given the same command in general. So one more slide, and then we'll open up for q and I'll read uh, Clayton and Carol's question here. And then First uh, Thessalonians 5, 16 through 21. Rejoice evermore, pray, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, and hold fast that which is good. And sometimes we need other people to help other people to see those things because they blinded themselves and they don't realize they're blind. And some want to stay blind. And then that's between them and their maker. And it's not our job to beat people over the head with a club to make them see. But there are people, each and every one of us, I'm sure many times within our lives have been in air, have been blind to certain things. And God by whatever means he has used, has brought us into the light in that area. Sometimes he's used others of us in this room, perhaps, or others, maybe somebody on TV we saw or something or something and we were reading, but he has used other means. And so what a blessed opportunity. We get to perhaps play that role in someone else's life, in some small part, whatever it is. It's God that does the work. But for whatever reason, he's chosen the foolishness of human beings to help spread his word and his joy. So, brothers and sisters, I hope this has been edifying. I know I enjoyed very much uh, studying deeper into this topic, and I got a lot more. There is so much out there to read and, and learn um, and, and, and just go out into the world and see what, what's going on. So I will end this sermon, and I'll open it up with a little Q&A. So if, if anyone has uh, any, any questions, I may not have an answer right now for them. Uh, and I might enlist the assistance of others in the room if they're willing, if anybody has anything. But uh, I want to get them out because I think that that's one. It's We don't ask questions. To be, the, I, I got to believe that everybody probably that is hearing my voice right now has at one time or another, and probably more than that, you know, had doubts about, well, how, why is this going on in the world? I don't understand. I don't know how to answer this. I don't, you know. So... Uh, so Clayton, and, um, wait, is the CCT? I don't know if that's Clayton and Carol or is that? I think so. I'm not sure who's. Anyway, so CCT has typed into the room here. A second, let me get it back up. So what if Elohim allowed it when you look back at all the examples, such as the original rebellion, Satan, to sin, Till iniquity found in him examples such as Eve and Adam, Abraham and Sarah, etc., to show us the consequences of not trusting him and strict co um, compliance for the best outcome, his good and perfect will for all. So, yeah, that's a great example. That's they are even Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about these things were written for examples for us that we don't do the same thing. Uh, Job is another great example of, you know, the, why is that, what, you know. Uh, Mary typed in here, Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 7, or 5 through 9. So that's the full one, it, it repenteth God that he made man. And so I'm not sure, is there, I'm not sure, Mary, if that is a question there, or then I know it might be hard to type on the spot there. I don't know what kind of, where people are sitting so, and if there's anybody here in house that has anything, yeah, I would, I would really, especially like to hear if, as I was going through some of these, either, either you thought one of them was like you're completely off base on that, or, um, or there's some, some reason that you think is a good reason that would maybe help a lot of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. I'll mention that. So, yes. Yeah. So, so Mary cited uh, 
uh, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. I'll read those real quick here. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Those are the, these are the generations of Noah. And Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So yeah, there's definitely a good example there, Mary, of how we can look back on this and see. And, and Brian brought up also, as we were talking about some of this earlier this week, that one of the one of the I would consider heretical approaches to this is what's called open theism that God doesn't know everything necessarily and this is one of the verses that they cite well it repented God well what do you mean he changed his mind I mean didn't he know that that was going to happen so they use this verse and out of Genesis 22 with Abraham where I know you now they use a verse out of uh, Micah or was uh, or Amos or Hosea I forget uh, yeah there were and out of Jonah, where he's worried. So he was going to destroy Nineveh. And then he's like, he didn't. What? God didn't know. He changed his mind. So they use those as evidence, supposed evidence that, see, God doesn't know everything. But this can be taken in a completely different context that does not include that gap in God's omniscience. Well, you know, the Lord knew from the world the beginning of the world, but the land was clean from the foundation of the world. So he knew the solution to the problem that hadn't been Right. As Brian says, we, you know, there's many examples where God, you know, from the foundation of the world, Christ died. So he knew before. It's not like Adam and Eve sinned. And then he's like, oh, I got to come up with plan B now. What am I going to do? So thank you for that. Anybody else? If so if something else comes up, I, I still, I still, there's a lot of stuff on this, I think, that I need to dig into and just to be more helpful to people. Who are who are lost, you know? Tim? So yeah, so Tim Tim uh, mentioned Tim mentioned the uh, um, the Augustinian theodicy that when sin came into the world, i.e., Satan was given dominion over the earth because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. That that's when everything got messed up and earthquakes earthquakes started happen and all that tornadoes and everything so that is that is a possible but augustine takes it to the point of he says definitively that is the reason whereas i would posit that it has some plausibility that it could be a reason or a contributing factor scripture doesn't tell us specifically that is why there are earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and and we don't we don't know so some things that we consider evil like i said they may still have existed so every spring the rivers might overflow their banks and you know i mean we don't know so we call we would consider a flood now evil that's not there there might have been you know there might have been tornadoes and stuff that, that we don't know all that you know things that necessarily we consider evil we know there was no death there was no sin there was no suffering no sadness we know those things so so however a world would exist that could include floods and not those things would be difficult for us to perceive. And we don't need to, it may have existed prior previous in the garden and we don't know what eternity is going to be like, but it will be, there'll be no more tears. There'll be no more suffering. So good point, Tim. Thank you. Or share of a doubt in God. Uh, this is one of the aspects we'd like to discuss more fully at the feast. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is topics like this, and that we would like to, in an, in a more informal, structured but informal setting, uh, open up dialogue on to discuss an open dialogue. So this has been a very didactic presentation, which is good, but it's gone on for almost two hours now, which for me is a very long sermon. Um, <laughs> and 
so it would be it would be more interactive so it's not going to the plan isn't that during the feast it will be more interactive and such so and it won't necessarily just be on this topic but topics of a similar vein all right then if nobody else has anything thank you very much brothers and sisters godspeed brian come on up and close us out please <laughs>